Welcome to the shooting show. Stand by for shots fired. Hello, I'm Johnny Rowland, your host of the shooting show, and welcome again to this week's program. We're so glad to be with you. We have a great show for you. We have some very interesting interviews that we're going to be doing on today's program. And you know, friends, one of the things that, that is so important, sometimes it seems like as shooters, we may be our own worst enemies. Let me tell you what happened to me the other day. I was on the phone with a representative from one of the largest gun associations in the country. And I was explaining to them, said, well, we're in a lull right now. The anti-gun types are, are preparing for their next uh, a wave of attack, whatever they're going to do. And I said, now's the time to strike. And I said, you know, you can do this by working with us here on the shooting show. Well, this individual said, well, uh, you're going to have to submit a plan to somebody in some city way over here and then they're going to submit it to somebody in Washington or some other place, and then they're going to have it approved by another committee. I said, you don't understand. I said, we need to cut through the red tape. We've got to do some things because these people in Washington, some of these anti-gun types on local levels, they're going to take these guns away from us if we don't stand up and be counted now, if we don't put a stop to it. This lady said, well, this is the way we've always done it. I said, well, the way we've always done it is not working. We've got to do more things. I said, here's our program on five days a week nationwide. I said, you know, we're offering you an opportunity to work and present your message as a gun association out to the rest of the country. She said, well, this is the way we've always done it. Well, friends, let me tell you what. We cannot do the same old things uh, that we've always done in the past. We've got to make a stand. We've got to get on the phone and write letters to some of these congressmen because really that's where our hope is, is in the House of Representatives because those people are only there for two years. That's not long enough. I've heard senators say, well, they pulled some bone or did some stunt, say, well, in six years people will have forgotten about it. Well, <laughs> apparently there's some truth to that. But the House of Representatives, they're only there for two years, and they're running for re-election. Friends, here's what we can do. We can contact our representative and tell them how we feel. Let them know we've got to write those letters, and we're going to be telling you how to do that. One of the things you can do is join the Shoot and Show Gun Club because, friends, it's a tremendous help to us through the, our own gun club, helping us reach more and more people because if we don't do it, well, who's going to? If we don't make a stand, if we don't put a stop to some of these people and their lunatic ideas, and I'm being charitable when I say lunatic because this is a family show, there are other things that we could say about them, but the thing is we have got to put a stop to it. We've got to defend our own rights. In some cases here, the government has turned on us the decent American citizen. Well, friends, that's got to stop. That's got to change, and you can do it by helping us and join the Shooting Show Gun Club. Well, we do have a great show for you. We're going to be talking about about different things we can do and let's uh <laughs> i'm holding a an old nylon 66 remington semi-automatic 22 long rifle and yes some of the anti-gun people would say this is an assault gun well the 22 semi-automatics have been around since the early 1900s it's outrageous that people who know nothing about guns who know nothing about you and i want to tell us what we can and can't have in our homes and what we can and can't have to defend ourselves. Friends, this is outrageous. I mean, it is outrageous. Yes, it's time to get mad. We've sat around, we've said, well, uh, we're going to let somebody else take care of it or, or uh, somebody down here, they'll vote the right way or I don't feel like voting or I don't feel like writing a letter. Well, let me tell you what, our way of life is going to be over with. Now, you trust me on this one. Our literally, the, the way of life, our freedom here in America, the only thing that protects us and our form of government is that Second Amendment. Now, everything else follows the Second Amendment because it's the amendment that can keep the government honest. Now, they know it, and doggone it, we better find out about it because this is how it works. And friends, they're going to take them away if we don't stand up. If we absolutely, if we don't, make ourselves counted now. Well, let's open another shooting show with uh, <laughs> our nylon 66, which uh, some of the unwashed and unlearned would call an assault 22. Yeah, yeah, that's right, really an assault gun, uh-huh. It doesn't uh, have an extended magazine. It does not have a, a selector to make it selective fire. It does not fire fully automatically. 
So, yeah, that's in, in their minds. The problem is, friends, these people are beyond reason. You know what? When you have someone who is not reasonable, who is, in fact, beyond reason, will not listen to reason, the only thing you can do is overpower them. And we've got to do it, and there's more than enough of us to do it. You know, we only need 5% of the population. We only need 12.5 million gun owners who will say, hey, enough's enough. I mean, let's stop it. Oh, we want it stopped now. We're going to stand up. We're not going to let them get away with it. It only takes 12 and a half million people who are dedicated out of our entire population to do just about anything we want to do. And friends, we have got to do it. So sign up here because, doggone it, we're doing everything we can on the shooting show. Well, let's open another shooting show. You know, the front sight, the key to accuracy is focusing in on that front sight. It doesn't matter whether it's upside down or behind the gun with a mirror, whatever, as long as you can focus on that front sight. So let's, uh, let's shoot a steel plate with them in, shall we say, a different position. <laughs> like I said, focus on the front sight. You know, friends, we've had a lot of correspondence from different viewers around the country about Corbin ammunition. And let me tell you what, Corbin, as far as delivering the most consistent, the absolute highest performance ammunition that I'm aware of that money can buy, their quality control is terrific. They're very nice people, and I tell you what, a lot of the major manufacturers better look out because Corbin is definitely on their way, simply because you can buy ammunition from Corbin that will outperform any other brand of ammunition that I'm aware of. Now, they make handgun ammunition, of course, uh, as well as, as rifle and uh, now some specialty calibers. This is something a lot of us have not been able to get in the past for some of the uh, unusual guns that we may have. Well, just for grand since we're here, here is a standard ball 45 ACP. Let's shoot our water jug here. And this is the uh, same ammunition, essentially, that has uh, really been famous in this old war horse, 1911, uh, since just after 1900. And no one will dispute that the 45 ACP, as it comes even in a ball round, is an effective handgun round. So let's look uh, at our water jug here. It's going to fall over, but watch it when the bullet hits it. Okay, see we've got a <laughs> hole in and hole out, and it sort of fell off the block there, and yes, it's just going to let the water run out. Well, let's try the same drill, put that over there, file 13. Let's try the same drill. We have another volunteer water jug here. Let's take a Corbin 45 ACP. 200 grain jacketed hollow point bullet moving at about 1,075 or 1,100 feet per second. Let's try the same drill. Well, I think you can, <laughs> I think you can see there's a dramatic, yeah, I did get <clears throat> water all over me and the gun, won't hurt us, won't hurt me or the gun for that matter. Uh, you can see <laughs> the difference that velocity makes. Now some may say, well, you're shooting water jugs, but what we're showing here is a little bit of the, shall we say, the difference in striking energy. Of course, you have hole in, hole out, but it also blew the bottom out uh, strictly due to the hydraulic shock of that big bullet expanding in that, uh, in that velocity. So uh, needless to say, I'm a big fan. If you come out here and you find me wearing my 45 ACP, you can bet that there's going to be some Corbin ammunition in that government model. Now, friends, of course, they make a complete line of the highest performance uh, ammunition, uh, some of the best ammunition, I think, that money can buy at any price. So for information on the Corbin product line, call them at 1-800-626-7266. Again, 1-800-626-7266. Well, friends, we're going to look at a gun today that I think is misunderstood by a lot of people uh, in the very, for what it's for. We're going to look at a two-shot Derringer in 22 Magnum. Now, this particular gun is, uh, when we show a close-up of, of it in a moment, you're going to see it's, shall we say, not real pretty. My father bought this gun back in the early 1960s, and I don't even know what brand it is. It uh, is apparently made in Germany. It has Germany on the side there. And it's made in the Remington pattern. 
Uh, this particular old gun, of course, we've had it all these years. They uh, have a little latch here on the side, and we'll take a closer look in a second. And of course, your barrels come up forward, and then you have an ejection system here in the center that will eject your uh, empty cartridge cases. You know, the 22 Magnum, as you've heard me say before on the program, is a very potent little cartridge, especially in the hollow point uh, different varieties that are out there. And in the Derringer, we have found the CCI Maxi Mag uh, to be the hottest uh, ammunition as far as, as ballistic performance uh, in this small uh, Derringer here. Now you've got barrels here that are probably two and a half or so inches, but you have a closed breech situation here, so you're going to get slightly higher velocities than say you would in a revolver about this size. Now believe it or not, these Maxi Mags and this old, uh, shall we say, very inexpensive gun actually run about 1150 or so feet per second. Now friends, that impressed me. That's pretty darn good performance. The other brands, uh, the Winchester and the Federal we tried, were not quite as hot, but the Maxi Mag really showed off pretty well. Uh, that is, you can roughly look at it like half a nine millimeter. And tell you the truth, the 22 Magnum, I think, is more effective, sort of out of proportion to its size, because that little bullet does a lot of things when you hit a game animal or if you did have to use this gun in self-defense. Now, it is small, yes, but uh, the 22 Magnum, in my opinion, will not be that far behind, say, a standard velocity 38 Special as far as effectiveness. In fact, it might even be a little better than, say, a standard velocity 38 special or, say, a wad cut or something like that. Uh, this is somewhat of a, a controversial gun because a lot of the authorities say, well, uh, I don't believe that I'd want to carry a two-shot derringer period because, one, they're not very accurate. Uh, you do have to become familiar with the guns on how they work and tell you the truth. Now, this is a gun that I personally have never really carried. Uh, we used to keep it in the truck years ago around here on the farm. Uh, we put snake shot in it, and this little gun here has ended the careers of many a water box, and believe me, uh, the snake shot in 22 Magnum is pretty effective out, say, oh, four or five feet out there, and really that's closer than I want to be to a snake. Most of you know I'm like Indiana Jones. I hate snakes. <laughs> but, uh, and yeah, we may get mail from the animal lovers out there, but that's okay. That's my right as an American. I can hate snakes if I want to. Okay, that said. Well, here we go. <laughs> These are surprisingly effective on, uh, say, snakes and rats, things like that, out to a few feet out there. Now, to tell you the truth, I don't recall ever having shot this gun for accuracy, and we're going to do that in just a minute on our paper target here. But th these little guns typically are pretty rugged. They're uh, fairly simple in how they work. You have a half-cock safety. In fact, let's stop for a moment, and let's take a closer look at it. Hi, I'm Bob Brown, Vietnam veteran and publisher of Soldier of Fortune magazine, described by some as the most politically incorrect magazine in the United States. Every issue we publish in-depth, provocative articles by our investigative reporters on the efforts of gun-grabbing politicians and the BATF to undermine our Second Amendment rights and what you can do to stop them. Also, on-site coverage of the government's abuse of power as occurred in the Randy Weaver tragedy and the Waco fiasco. No puff, no fluff, in-depth technical reviews of new firearms and ammo. In short, hard-hitting action articles of immediate interest to all real Americans, available from no other mainstream media. You need the other side of the story. That's why I'm offering a one-year subscription to Soldier of Fortune for only $22. That's over a 50% saving. Also, we're going to throw in a free 67-page bonus coverage of all our Waco material that's appeared in Soldier of Fortune and how it affects you. Call our 1-800 number now. And friends, you can call our Shoot and Show 800 number. That's 1-800-895-7916. Ask for Department SOF for Soldier of Fortune and we'll take MasterCard or Visa, check or money order. So call us at 1-800-895-7916. Department SOF, $22 for a year of Soldier of Fortune plus the Waco supplement. It's a great bargain, friends, for a great magazine. 
Friends, let me remind you, it will take six to eight weeks normally to get your subscription started. And, of course, they're going to be sending out the Waco supplement immediately. And bear in mind that due to our ice storm, our office was closed down, essentially, for nine days. And uh, so we're playing catch-up. So please forgive us for being that extra week and a half late. The Shoot and Show will be right back after this break for your local cable company or TV station. Friends, you can tell, yes, indeed, the Derringer is a very small handgun. And as we were looking a moment ago, you ha we have a latch here on the side. You'll pull the latch all the way around, and then the barrels tip up. Now, of course, there are a number of different companies today making uh, Derringers, such as the American Derringer Company down in Waco, Texas, uh, the uh, Davis Derringers, which are similar in the way they work. Now, this particular gun, you can see, here is your ejector right here. Uh, as you can see, there is no safety anywhere on this particular old gun, and there are a lot of these out there except a half cock on the hammer. And I don't know if I would be comfortable carrying, I, I would be afraid that maybe if you drop the gun and it fell on the hammer, I don't know, it might go off, it might not. Now we're looking at a product here of a company that probably, for that matter, no longer even exists. But uh, anyway, the basic Remington pattern is what has been around for, oh my, who knows how many years. They started making these back in, I suppose, back in the 1800s. I really don't know when, but I know it's a long time ago. Anyway, what happens is the firing pins alternate. Let's see if we can get a, a look at that. The firing pins, and here they are, there's the lower pin and the top pin, it will alternate. When you cock the gun and release the hammer, see the uh, top cylinder would fire then. You cock it again and release the hammer, and now the bottom firing pin comes up. It has a little rotating uh, hammer situation there, or some internal parts, and they work remarkably well. They're simple, they're robust, and this particular gun, as you can see, has a couple of steel inserts. Uh, the outside of the barrel here is probably zinc or something like that, but it has steel inserts, uh, and you can plainly see where they are there. But I tell you what, the old gun wasn't very expensive. I, I imagine it was about 25 or so dollars back about 1962. But uh, I tell you what, here it's still chugging along today. It still works. Well, let's go ahead and load the gun. And I do happen to have a couple of, of uh, cartridges handy. If I can ever get them out. Now then, just put them in like so. Push them in place. All right, we'll close the barrels. The gun's got to be on half cock. We'll close it and we will latch it. Now then, friends, you can see our sights are somewhat rudimentary at best. But let's see what kind of two-shot group we get. Let's go ahead. We'll thumb cock it. And we're going to use our sights, put it below our bullseye, and of course it went off. Well, and I think we actually hit the bullseye. Well, let's try it again and see where the next shot goes. And right well, friends, I am as surprised as you are probably. We have one shot in our little bullseye there. Let's ease up and take a look at it. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, certainly surprised that we had accuracy that good. Uh, we're at about 10 feet from the target, I suppose, and that's actually, believe it or not, only about a half or three quarters of an inch apart. So uh, I am somewhat surprised on the accuracy of our uh, old two-shooter here. Now, friends, uh, tell you the truth, uh, you may be surprised at the accuracy, but no more than me. Uh, my goodness, uh, of course, I don't know if it'll do it again or not, but I know that my father used to be able to shoot snakes pretty well with uh, uh, 22 Magnum ammunition. I tell you what, this is the sort of gun that 
uh, would best be termed as a backup gun or uh, a gun that maybe you're going to keep snake shot in it or maybe a gun that is small enough for you to hide somewhere the new ones have different have a little safety mechanism like the american derringer this one does not on these old guns that are similar to this i just don't know if i would carry it loaded or not of course guns no good to you if you're going to carry it unloaded but uh, I think, it, it, let's say it appears to be a fairly robust half cock notch. That's the only safety you've got. But thankfully, the newer models do have a positive safety. But I tell you what, for what it is, the 22 Magnum in this small gun that's very easily concealable, and let me remind you, we never advocate breaking the law, but concealed carry permits are available in many places in the country. And of course, all safety rules do apply with this. We never point this gun at anything we cannot afford to shoot, in fact. Of course, we'll open it and we will push out the uh, empty cartridges. Uh, you do have enough hammer foil on this uh, little Derringer that you, your ignition is pretty consistent. So, you know, if, if you're looking, of course, just wanting one of these guns and owning one for collection purposes as far as I'm concerned, it's certainly enough reason to have one, but the Derringers do have a place. Uh, one, to, to back up a larger gun, or possibly uh, you might be in some situation where you could not have a larger gun. Although the small revolvers are not a whole lot bigger than this, but uh, for that matter, maybe just like the simplicity of the Derringer. Well, it's 22 Magnum now, is loud, it is. <laughs> and it has a little muzzle flash. This is no joke now. And friends, this is basically an up close and personal defense gun. And of course, the 22 Magnum uh, up close is certainly going to have quite a bit of power. Like, as I said earlier, maybe more than we would normally think. But these are simple to operate guns, and it is definitely an alternative. And, and like we say, if you just like Derringers, well, there's no reason in the world you shouldn't be able to own one. You know, friends, we never know about a particular gun when we get all kinds of things that come through our program here. You just don't know. And, uh, in fact, even a little gun like this, very inexpensive, uh, that's, oh, probably 35 or, or at least 30-some-odd years old, can display surprising accuracy. Let's look at our steel plate out here at about 15 yards. <laughs> like I said, you never know. And now, friends, we're going to hear from Jim Pate, our investigative reporter down on the scene in San Antonio at the Branch Davidian trial for an update. Hi, Johnny. Hi, folks. Um, as you can see, I'm at home working today. The uh, jury in the trial, the Waco uh, trial, is out. Um, by the time you get this, the eight women and four men will have begun de deliberations. Uh, testimony ended um, last week. Uh, it was rather su a surprise ending. The uh, defense team uh, rested after calling only eight witnesses, about a day and a half of testimony. In contrast, the federal government uh, spent six weeks covering 125 witnesses. Um, some of the last testimony presented by the government involved uh, transcripts of um, uh, FBI eavesdropping devices that were uh, secretly sent into, into Mount Carmel, the uh, Branch Davidian uh, home outside Waco, Texas. And uh, after a sort of a, a floundering prosecution, the government did end in somewhat of a stronger position than they'd had during the uh, six weeks previously. The uh, transcript of these eavesdropping devices, uh, I thought anyway, were very convincing that um, as the government's been saying all along, that the Branch Davidians had spread fuel around the, uh, the rooms in Mount Carmel um, in the early morning hours of the last day, April 19th, before the fire. Uh, there is some reason to believe, though, Johnny, that uh, they weren't trying to set the place on fire as much as they were trying to set the tanks on fire. Uh, there are several references in the transcripts to don't light the fire until they, you know, unless they come through the walls. Um, I think this this fuel business might have been an attempt uh, to defend themselves from tanks that were literally knocking the building down around their ears. Uh, one of the tank drivers had said one of their first jobs when they came through the 
when they started battering the walls down that morning was to um, spray gas in the area where there was a trap door leading to an escape tunnel underground. They wanted to, to deny them access to that escape tunnel. I thought that was uh, rather suspicious. Uh, the defense evidence presented was strong in a couple of areas. They called Jack Zimmerman, um, who is a uh, defense attorney from Houston, Texas. He's not involved in this case except as a witness. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman, uh, who's, who some of you might have seen an interview with uh, Jack Zimmerman, I did in Soldier Fortune magazine in the October 1993 issue. Mr. Zimmerman was Steve Schneider's attorney. Um, and while in the compound uh, allowed in there by the FBI, he examined, uh, talked to a lot of people. Um, he does not buy this business about suicide either. He, um, he uh, looked at bullet holes in the front door. Uh, the half of the front door that the government uh, mysteriously has been unable to produce at trial. Mr. Zimmerman, who's a uh, very seasoned combat veteran from Vietnam and is still a, a judge in the Marine Corps Reserve, said that uh, all of these were entry holes and he called them a um, spray pattern, like a machine gun. And this was the door that, that David Koresh had opened when he went to talk to the ATF agents. Um, Mr. Zimmerman's most interesting testimony concerned bullet holes that he saw coming straight down through the roof. Uh, in two different rooms. One of them was David Koresh's bedroom and he said the trajectory was such that um, number one you could look up and you could see daylight uh, through the roof and the ceiling when you lined up the holes and that the trajectory indicated that these had to have been uh, fired from somewhere above the compound. Now several of the Branch Davidians have said that they were fired on by helicopters. Uh, this is something that the government has denied uh, strenuously. Um, there were three helicopters involved in the raid. Uh, the pilots of two of those helicopters came and testified that no one fired, uh, no one fired from their aircraft. We don't know what, uh, what the story may be for the third helicopter. Uh, the government would not produce the pilot of that helicopter. Uh, the 911 tapes uh, were played as part of the defense. Um, they called Lieutenant Larry Lynch of the McLennan County Sheriff's Department in Waco. Um, the judge, interestingly enough, would not let the jury hear the part of the 911 tape where uh, Wayne Martin, the Branch Davidian who called, and Mr. Martin was a Harvard-educated attorney who, who died in the fire with uh, three of his seven children. His wife and his four kids had come out earlier, four of his younger kids. Mr. Martin said in the 911 tape two things that were very interesting. Number one, there was a statement that, they, that the helicopters were coming over again and that they were shooting at us. Uh, the judge didn't let the jury hear that. And Mr. Martin made a statement early on that, um, that the ATF had opened fire on the Branch Davidians when David Koresh had gone to the front door to try and talk to them. Uh, for some reason, the judge would not let the jury hear that testimony. Uh, we thought we were going to hear, uh, we thought we were going to hear testimony from a gun dealer named Henry McMahon. Henry McMahon was interviewed in the, uh, in the November issue of Soldier of Fortune, a lot of these key witnesses uh, Soldier of Fortune uh, had interviewed early on. I'm trying to find this here. I'm going to show it to you. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. This is Henry and his wife Karen. Karen actually was called as a prosecution witness, although most of her testimony was favorable to the defense. Um, Henry uh, was going to testify that, that David Koresh knew seven months before the raid that the ATF were investigating him. Uh, Davey Aguilera, the case agent, came over to McMahon's house to ask about guns that Koresh had bought from McMahon, who was a gun dealer, a legitimate gun dealer, I might add. He had a very successful business, um, had, a lot of, of, um, had a lot of customers who were law enforcement agents. As a matter of fact, in this article here, there's a picture. I don't know if you, you can see it. That's Henry and Karen right there, and this is Clint Peoples, who is a legend among the Texas Rangers, who was curator of the Texas Ranger Museum in Waco. And this is a picture of Henry and Ranger Peoples and Karen in the museum. Um, so despite the government's contention that, that, that Henry is some sort of unreliable criminal type person, Henry had a very successful gun business. And um, when, the, when the ATF agents came over to ask him about these gun purchases seven months prior to the raid, he went in the other room and got David Koresh on the phone and said, David, why are, why are the ATF over here asking about these gun purchases? What's wrong? Trying to do the right thing. And Koresh said, there's nothing wrong. 
let me talk to Mr. Aguilera, or better yet, tell him to come over and I'll let him look at the guns, uh, whatever it is he wants to see. Uh, Mr. McMahon went in the other room with a cordless telephone and said, um, I've got David Koresh on the phone right here. Uh, he said he'd be happy to talk to you. Mr. McMahon said Agent Aguilera got very paranoid, started acting very strange, and said, no, we don't want to talk to him. We don't want to talk to him. Um, and in fact, McMahon learned a week later that the ATF, even then, s seven months before the raid, they were already planning a raid. They had no intention of peacefully trying to arrest David Koresh. Um, unfortunately, the jury didn't get to hear any of that testimony. Again, the, the judge denied it. Uh, the, the defense accepted a compromise wherein they were just read a statement as to what Mr. McMahon would have testified to. Mr. McMahon would have been a very damaging witness uh, as far as the government's credibility was concerned. Um, after the raid happened, uh, Henry and Karen had already moved back to Florida. And in fact, when they went to see the ATF, when they heard about the raid, they were coming home from a gun show in Jacksonville, they went to the ATF uh, office in Pensacola, Florida and volunteered to help so we want to do whatever we can to prevent any more bloodshed. Um, so what does the ATF do? They took Henry and Karen, held them incommunicado in a motel in Pensacola for a couple days, then put them on an airplane and spirited them around the country um, uh, for the sole purpose of keeping Henry and Karen from talking to the Texas Rangers and the FBI who are investigating what in the heck happened out here at this compound when the ATF went, up, went, went out there to serve the search warrant. Um, uh, Johnny, I think it was really clear at the end of this trial that two things were clear to me. Um, yes, the, the members of the Branch Davidians had spread some fuel around the compound. It's not clear that they were trying to burn themselves up. It sounded more like uh, from conversation on the FBI bugs that they were trying to set the tanks on fire. And the other thing that was clear to me from listening to the um, the 911 tapes where you can see, you can hear a tremendous amount of gunfire. Um, it was clear that, that uh, number one, the ATF started the gunfight, and number two, every time that Lieutenant Lynch from the Sheriff's Department would convince the Davidians to stop shooting, then the ATF agents outside would not honor their half of the agreement, and two or three times they opened up again and um, started, started, started the gunfight all over again, trying to press that tactical advantage. Clearly, these were not honorable, uh, honest people, and um, we can only hope that they will have to answer for uh, their reckless actions in front of a grand jury, um, and that the next time we have a trial that the ATF agents will be the ones sitting at the defense table. Um, the judge has now said that he will let the jurors consider uh, the self-defense argument that the defense uh, attorneys have struggled for six weeks to, to put forward. Uh, the only problem with that is he's denied many cases their efforts to present evidence tending to s show self-defense. So while the, the defense attorneys can argue self-defense in a final argument, they don't have a lot of, of facts and evidence to, to press that argument with. Um, so uh, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, sort of hobble them in, in what they can do as far as, far as that goes. Uh, by the time I talk to you again, uh, like I said, the jury's going to be out deliberating, and I would expect we'd have a verdict in a week or two. Um, final arguments are, are due tomorrow, and then the jury will be deliberating. That'll be by Thursday, of course, that's when this will be on the air. And um, I'll be back to you next week and, um, and let you know what's going on down here in San Antonio with the Branch Davidian trial. Uh, from San Antonio for Shoot and Show and Soldier of Fortune magazine, this is Jim Pate. Thanks a lot, Johnny. See you next week. The Shoot and Show will be right back after this break for your local cable company or TV station.
You know, friends, all of us as shooting enthusiasts should be subscribing to Shotgun News, the training post for anything that shoots. Three big issues monthly with literally thousands of firearms bargains. Shotgun News, Post Office Box 669, Hastings, Nebraska, the zip code 68902, the phone number area 402-463-4589. For MasterCard or Visa for subscriptions only now, call them at 1-800-345-6923. Well, friends, we hope you're enjoying the program so far today. And, you know, yes, I have the old Colt Sporter here handy, just like I have this 1911 handy in my back pocket there. You know, friends, there's nothing wrong with us as normal and reasonable, responsible citizens owning guns like this Colt Sporter, which is similar to the AR-15 military rifle. You know what? Many times in our country's past, the citizen soldiers have had to come to the aid of our country many times. And, of course, now it, it seems that some of those people in government do not trust us to own weapons that we can defend ourselves and our homes with. And, friends, if when the government doesn't trust us to own guns like this, we can't trust the government. Just listening to Jim Pate a few minutes ago, uh, it's a terrible thing. It looks like the deck was stacked against the uh, defense down there in San Antonio. It's very distressing to see what is happening. When, when you go up before a court like that, and it appears that they may not get a fair shake. Now, that's just an opinion. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We hope that the jury makes the right decision. We absolutely do. The problem is the jury, it does not seem that the jury has been presented with all the evidence that was available. Very disturbing. Well, on a more positive note, uh, yours truly, I'm going to be at the 1994 Georgia Safari Club International Hunting Show and Fundraiser. Now, that is this weekend coming up, and those of you that are watching us on the Outdoor Channel, it'll be too late, but uh, certainly if you're one of our viewers, please come by and I'll tell you where it's going to be. It's going to be at the Galleria, and yes, I have my notes here somewhere, and yes, in fact, it's going to be at the Galleria Center that's adjacent to the Galleria Mall and Waverly Hotel, and let me tell you where that is. It's on, uh, uh, it intersects I-285 around Atlanta and I-75, and it's between uh, I-75 North and Highway 41, those exits on the uh, loop there, 285 around Atlanta. Now that's going to be Saturday on uh, February 26th. So please, if you're one of our viewers, please come by that day. Come by the gun show because there are going to be some really inter uh, interesting things on display there. And yours truly will be walking around with a camera doing interviews. And please come up and say hello. I'll be glad, certainly glad to meet you. But we're going to be there uh, this coming Saturday. And let me remind you, those folks on the Outdoor Channel Network that watch us, you can also catch our program on satellite on Thursday evenings at 9 o'clock Eastern on Galaxy 4 Channel 7. Again, 9 o'clock Eastern on G4 Channel 7 if you'd like to see our program on Thursday nights. Friends, we appreciate so much all of your letters and cards. The Shoot and Show Gun Club is coming along well. We need your help because we have so many things to do. As we've said earlier in the program, there are things going on in the government that literally have to be stopped, and we have got to do it. So please, if you can, join the Shoot and Show Gun Club today. Only $25 for an annual membership. You get to buy from the Bullet Express at our cost, plus 10%, plus shipping and handling. As we've said before, if you buy very much, you're going to get your membership feedback anyway. But we appreciate so much you folks being out there because we have a terrific job to be done. And if not us, well, who? And if not now, then when? So we have to do it. So we need your help. Please join the Shoot and Show Gun Club today. And now, friends, here's Art Alpin. That is Lieutenant Colonel Art Alpin, retired, formerly an instructor at West Point, now with the great A-Square Company in Bedford, Kentucky, building some of the finest big-game rifles and ammunition in the world. For information on Art's products from A-Square, call them at area 502-255-7456. When a cartridge weapon is discharged, a number of forces are generated and a great deal of energy is released. The idea of using these forces or the energy in order to cycle the weapon surfaced in the 1880s. Though many people worked on putting this idea to use, such as McLean, Lewis, and Hotchkiss, 
I would like to concentrate on two major contributors whose designs made a mark on the course of warfare. These are Hiram Maxim and John Browning. Maxim harnessed the recoil forces generated upon discharge in order to cycle the weapon. By the 1880s, he had some practical designs. Though they worked reasonably well, his automatic weapons became what we understand to be a machine gun only after the introduction of smokeless powder and jacketed bullets. You have seen these developments in a previous tape. By 1893, Maxim was selling perfectly functional machine guns. Among their first recorded uses was action in the Matabili War of that same year. The painting Brave Men depicts the death of Alan Wilson's Shangani Patrol. The patrol was an advance element of Forbes's mobile column. After the Nabili had annihilated Wilson, their 7,000-man army advanced on Forbes, who credited his salvation to the Maxim machine gun. Maxim worked at refining his designs, and by 1908, the Maxim machine gun had been adopted by Germany and was made under license there. The same weapon was adopted and manufactured in England, where it was known as the Vickers. John Moses Browning had been working on another method of cycling an automatic weapon using the very same gases which propelled the projectile. His first workable designs were made by Colt Marlin and used in the Spanish-American War. When the bullet passed a hole or gas port located underneath the barrel, gas escaped and pressed on a lever. The lever rode all the way back and then was pushed forward by a spring, thereby completely cycling the weapon. For obvious reasons, this gun was nicknamed the Potato Digger. As war clouds loomed, Browning quickly branched aside and designed a machine gun using Maxim's short recoil idea, since short recoil was a good bit more compatible with water cooling. Without getting into French or Austrian variations, you can safely assume that every major combatant in World War I entered the war with a machine gun. The capabilities of all of them were quite similar. I will use this Browning 1917 water-cooled as a good example. Most of these weapons fed from a belt. As the belt was pulled through the machine gun by these feed paws, individual rounds were pulled back out of the belt and then positioned on the bolt so that they would be next in line for chambering and firing. The Browning and the Maxim worked on the short recoil principle. In this method, the barrel, bolt, and barrel extension remain locked together after discharge and travel a short distance to the rear. After the bullet exits the barrel, the bolt then unlocks, sliding independently to the rear. The bolt comes back far enough so that the old cartridge case is extracted and ejected and a new cartridge is placed in position. The bolt then travels forward, chambering the cartridge, and fires again as long as the trigger is held down. The Maxim, Browning, and many others were water-cooled. The barrel was surrounded by a water jacket holding approximately five quarts of water. After 600 rounds of continuous fire, the water would be brought to a boil and steam would exit through a steam bleed-over valve down through this hose into a condenser bucket. The second assistant gunner kept refilling the jacket as water would boil away at the rate of one quart for every 250 rounds. Though the water did boil away, it was recovered in the condenser bucket. 
It also stabilized the operating temperature of the weapon and allowed continuous sustained fire. All of these weapons were extremely accurate and fired their rounds into a very small group, which in machine gun terminology is called the beaten zone. As an assist, they were equipped with a micrometer traversing and elevating mechanism so as to enhance their long-range accuracy. They also were chambered for the full-powered rifle cartridges of the nations involved, such as the 30-06 or 8mm Mauser. Let's see what this Browning can do. In its first target run, you'll see a silhouette target on top of a 4x4 fence post and two real sly buggers hiding behind a cinder block wall. The shooting show will be right back after this break for your local cable company or TV station. Did you ever try to throw an axe, throw a tomahawk, or throw a knife? Well, now you can with AccuBlades, free video on the art of throwing weapons, free with any axe, tomahawk, or knife order. All AccuBlade products are made by hand in the USA. Please allow four to six weeks delivery. Friends, remember that supplies are limited. Specify whether you want the axe, the tomahawk, or the knife. Send $34.95 plus $5 shipping and handling or $84.95 plus $7 shipping and handling for all three. Now you can send a check or money order to AccuBlade, Box 206, Lockport, Illinois. That zip code is 60441. Now then, if you'd like to charge it on your MasterCard or on Visa, you can call us here at the show, 1-800-895-7916, Department AccuBlade, and we can charge it to your MasterCard or Visa. Now, friends, remember that this past week, in fact, past week and a half, our office was essentially closed because of the ice storm here. We, had, we were out of electricity and we're behind on some of the orders for the Bullet Express as well as some of the uh, AccuBlade knives. So please hang with us. Uh, we're, we're catching up as fast as we can. That's pretty impressive. The Browning fired such a small group that it had no problem cutting down the 4x4 post in short order. Both the wall and the two guys hiding behind it took a severe drubbing. This latter target illustrates a point. A wall, unless it is solid masonry, is no real protection against small arms fire from full-powered rifle cartridges. Next, we'll engage a group of targets in the open using the traversing and elevating mechanism and a final assault of targets online. See if you can spot some advantages and disadvantages of the water cool.
The advantages of the water-cooled machine gun are quite obvious. It is extremely accurate, can fire at very long ranges, and has a very high sustained volume of fire. In fact, the water-cooled machine gun is unique among machine guns in that its sustained volume of fire is just about the same as its cyclic rate. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here today with Ed Tuggle, and Ed is besides a friend of ours, uh, he's also a member of the Arklatex Gun Collectors Association based here in Shreveport, of which I'm proud to say, yes, I am a member. And Ed uh, does a number of different things, but uh, he is a, uh, works with the Hunter Education Program and uh, Wildlife and Fisheries Department here in Louisiana. He's also a coach for the NRA shooting team with young people. And Ed, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do, sir, please? Well, I, today I'm kind of wearing two hats here. Uh, I'm the president of the Louisiana Hunter Education Instructors Association, mm -hmm. and I'm also the head coach of the Caddo Bozier Youth Shooting Club's Hunter Education team. Mm -hmm. um, I'm involved in, in both of those endeavors. Mm -hmm. well, now, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about your shooting team, if you would. Now, uh, you folks, your teams hold a couple of national records, is that right? That's correct. We we have um, participated this year in the NRA Youth Hunter Education Challenge, mm -hmm. as we have in the past. This year we won the North American Championship in both the senior and the junior division. The junior division is kids 10 through 14 years of age, mm -hmm. and the seniors 15 through 18. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have something real unusual in your team now uh, that you said, I believe, that uh, what is very unlikely to happen, uh, tell us what that was. Please. Well, it's, it's real unique. The um, uh, the senior individual winner was Russell Sullivan, a local uh -huh. boy from one of our one of our kids on our team, mm -hmm. and uh, the senior, I mean the junior individual winner was Sharon Sullivan, his sister. <laughs> so brother and sister took first place in both the senior and the junior divisions this year. Well, you could have another mm -hmm. Kay and Jim Clark here working up. You don't ever know it. Possibly so. <laughs> this is the first time that a that a girl has ever won this uh, this event. My goodness. Well, what mm -hmm. kind of rifles, what kind of guns are they using in this uh, competition? The, the rifles uh, that they shoot, they shoot 22 rifles and on a on a field type course where mm -hmm. they shoot an animal type targets mm -hmm. ranges mm -hmm. from 18 through 75 yards. Mm -hmm. uh, they also shoot uh, 12 gauge shotguns on a sporting clays type tar mm -hmm. uh, course. Mm -hmm. um, then they also shoot uh, muzzle loading rifles at animal type targets on uh, at ranges varying out to 75 yards. Mm -hmm. Which and is they also shoot archery. Well, uh, certainly muzzleloading, mm -hmm. we were talking about that a little earlier, we need to do some more muzzleloading features on our program, and yes, uh, you folks will be seeing more muzzleloading uh, uh, events on our program. Now tell us about the other job you do. Tell us about your other hat with the uh, Wildlife and Fisheries. Well, actually I'm the president of the Louisiana Hunter Education Instructors Association. Mm -hmm. It's a volunteer organization. Mm -hmm. We have, um, uh, I've heard recent counts, up to 1,600 instructors in this state. Now that's just all, in the state of Louisiana. That's in uh -huh. the state of Louisiana. Uh -huh. And uh, they all volunteer their time to teach hunter education mm -hmm. classes, um, certifying this year a little over 17,000 people. Now what, when you say certify someone, you uh, test them for uh, gun safety, for hunting knowledge regulation, is that what y'all do? As we teach a class in, um, in hunter education that uh, consists of uh, ethics, wildlife management, mm -hmm. um, of course firearm safety, uh, and many aspects of hunter education. The class is a minimum 10 hours long. Ours usually run about 14 here. Well, you know, this is a good point. A lot of times the anti-gun types will say, well, there's no training available or whatever for people, but there is. And you have some very fine people like Ed here who are down there donating their time or volunteering their time for to help a lot of uh, mostly younger people I'm gonna guess uh, that come through your courses am I right it's true we do have a lot of young people coming because now it's a mandatory thing mm -hmm. anybody born on or after September the 1st 1969 mm -hmm. has to have mm -hmm. the hunter education certificate which mm -hmm. they were receiving this class 
in order to purchase a hunting license in this state. So they have to be certified before they can get a hunting license. And, and we're in support of programs like this because, you know, friends, there are a lot of us out there, and we've got to start doing more to, one, teach people how to properly use firearms and teach people about, as you said a moment ago, the ethics of hunting. Because there are a number of things. You know, you don't shoot at, at noise in the woods. You, that's a no-no. You just don't do that. And I'm sure you cover things like this about hunter safety, of, of how, uh, uh, where to unload your gun before getting in a vehicle, things like this. And we certainly applaud, applaud your efforts there. Mm -hmm. And, Ed, we appreciate so much you coming down to be with us today. And, and uh, the good news is there are some other uh, gentlemen out there. In fact, I'm sure you have some women in the, in the instructor program uh, in different places in the country. And uh, we're in support of their efforts because we need everyone to do everything they can to ensure, one, safe gun handling and to ensure our future as hunters. You know, reliving the past can sometimes open up a whole new future. Hi, I'm Gritz Gresham. And take it from me, muzzle-loading guns offer a brand new kind of old-fashioned shooting fun. Muzzle loaders provide a uniquely different way to test your shooting skills. And you can also hunt during the special muzzle-loading season. So take a step back in time and give muzzle loading a try. And to make sure you get the right black powder gun and gear you need, see the real pro in your community. Well, friends, we want to remind you that we're going to be in Atlanta, Georgia, on Saturday, February 26th. That's this weekend from when we're doing the show now. And we're going to be at the Georgia Safari Club International Hunting Show and Fundraiser. Now, that's going to be at the Galleria Center, adjacent to the Galleria Mall and Waverly Hotel, there in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, I'm going to be there most of the day on Saturday. And please, if you're a viewer of the program, come on by and say hello. We'll be awfully glad to meet you. Until next week, of course, we've run out of time on today's program. But uh, please join the Shooting Show Gun Club today, and we'll see you next time on another Shooting Show. <laughs>